Two months in, how are Bearcat fans like you feeling about Scott Satterfield and a big game tonight in the Big Easy? We've got Mo Egger on to preview it right here on Locked On Bearcats. Our Locked On Bearcats, your daily podcast on the Cincinnati Bearcats. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, thank you so much for making Locked On Bearcats your first listen of every day. It's free and available everywhere you get your podcasts, including right here on YouTube. Don't forget to subscribe to our Locked On Bearcats YouTube channel. We're up to 705 subscribers. Keep those coming. Follow it, too, to get an alert every time we drop a new episode. Today's episode of Locked On Bearcats is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, the official sportsbook of Locked On. Make every moment more. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On today. To get started, my guest today is someone who's very familiar with FanDuel. That would be none other than ESPN 1530 and 700 WLW's Mo Egger. Mo, it's great to have you on. Um, we're two months in, and I, I saw you at the introductory press conference for Scott Satterfield. Um, from those you've talked to, from your perspective, your vantage point, what are fans and those close to the program saying about Scott Satterfield? How are they feeling about him as the next head coach of the Bearcats? I think fans are very much still wait and see, and I can understand why. They haven't even started spring ball yet. There's lots of questions in terms of the roster that are sort of floating around. I do think this. I, I think Scott Satterfield has been given a pretty soft landing by the Big 12 because the, the first ever season in the Big 12 will not see the Bearcats play TCU or Texas. They'll play five games at home. They're going to play all the schools that are moving into the Big 12, so you'll get some familiarity with UCF and uh, and with Houston. Uh, I, I do think this, though, I, I think relative to what everybody's fears were when Luke Fickle left, I think Scott and the, the the current regime has done a pretty good job of keeping enough guys around to at least give this team a chance, certainly on defense. Uh, Dante Corleone is still here. Deshaun Pace is still here. Ryan Montgomery is still here. Taj Ward is still here. Jawan Briggs is still here. Malik Van is still here. Uh, obviously, both Ben Bryant and Evan Prater are still here. That can change. Uh, there's a new transfer portal window that opens up in May, and I'd be willing to bet that there's at least a, a strong likelihood that a quarterback will leave based on what happens during spring ball. But again, I, I think relative to what everybody's worst fears were, look, the timing of this was not in UC's favor. You're moving into the Big 12. You're taking a significant step up in competition. Uh, the way the college football calendar is set up, you lose a coach, uh, you're sort of swimming upstream. Um, to, to, to keep your, your current players from going to being able to hit the ground running when it comes to the transfer portal to get players to come into your program and to keep your, uh, your signing class, your recruiting class, as intact as possible. I think relative to what everybody feared, Scott Satterfield and his crew have done a pretty good job of, of, at, least, uh, of at least avoiding the worst-case scenario. And I'll, I'll also say this. Um, Scott Satterfield had his detractors in Louisville. And I can understand why, but, but everybody that I've talked to, even the folks who believed it was time for Scott to move on or who are some of his biggest attractors will acknowledge in terms of coaching offense, this guy knows what he's doing. Um, and I, I, I gather, I gather that if nothing else for all the success, the Bearcats have had over the last few years, there has been a fan appetite to see the Bearcats be a little bit more imaginative a little bit more creative, maybe a little bit more forward thinking offensively than they have been in recent years. And, and that's, that's no knock. I mean, look, they, they went 13 and 0 two years ago. Uh, they, they went undefeated in the regular season the year prior to that. Heck this year was a, a down year and they went nine and three, but I think this season, it sort of felt like the offense could use a little bit of a punch, a little bit of a, I don't know, philosophy change. I, I think fans are going to get that with Scott Satterfield. Um, the the uh, there's a lot of unknowns in terms of you know the wide receiver position, cornerback, offensive line, and the reality is they're taking a significant step up in competition even with the softer Big Twelve schedule. But uh, I think relative again to what everybody's worst fears were, things have kind of played out okay these last couple of months. Yeah, not only that, Mo, but you mentioned all the players that retain. I'll go to Kerry Combs and Walter Stewart. The fact that yeah. those guys, that those guys were retained on the coaching staff, and for what it's worth, and I brought this up last week on Locked On Bearcats, 
When Scott Satterfield took over Louisville in 2019, that program was obviously in dire straits. That, but here's the thing about that, Mo. That was 2018 when they went 2-10 and 10 and essentially bottomed out. That was their first year post-Lamar Jackson, and their offensive yards per game dropped by about 200. Enter Scott Satterfield, and their offensive line wasn't very good that year. That could be the case for the Bearcats. But Louisville still went up almost 100 yards per game offensively. You mentioned the offensive line and wide receivers and several um, key positions that are maybe in a quote-unquote rebuild. But how much of a factor do you think specifically offensive line and wide receiver, which have been two strengths of this team the past three years, how much of a factor will they play into the Bearcats and what they can do offensively this year? Well, your offensive line is always going to be a factor. Let's let's not pretend that's not the case. Um, I see a lot of talent at wide receiver. How that's going to play itself out, I your guess is as good as mine. I think we'll have a better sense of the answer to that question once uh, we get to the middle of April and, and spring ball is come and gone. What I'm more interested in than anything else is who's the quarterback going to be? Because Ben Bryant's still here. Uh, Evan Prater is still here. Emery Jones is now here. Uh, Brady Dragish is here. There's, there's four guys that I think you could make a case should be the starting quarterback. Now, some of those cases are going to be more, are going to be stronger than others. But my guess is one of those guys isn't going to be here by the time fall ball begins. And so how does that play itself out during camp? Because Scott Satterfield, I don't I don't believe they went out and got Emory Jones to have him not be in the battle to be the starting QB, but is it a legitimate battle? If so, who has the best chance of winning it? What's the fallout from one quarterback or the other not winning it? And ultimately, how long is the leash going to be? And how good is the quarterback play going to be? Look, Ben Bryant was was not as bad last year as some made him out to be. And unfortunately, it took watching Evan Prater struggle for some to realize, okay, Ben's not terrible. But I watched those games. He wasn't great. There were times he was deficient. He left a little to be desired. Uh, does 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 he have a, a, a role on this team this coming season? Um, does Evan Prater have a role on this team this coming season? How much do those two players improve? How much does the new system allow them to improve? Maybe more than the previous system would have allowed them. Um, and is Emory Jones just the guy? And and how good can he be in this offense? For the first time in quite a while, you know, last year, as much as I do believe it was a legitimate competition, we knew that Ben Bryant was going to be the starting quarterback. And I think we had a decent sense of how that would play out. The previous couple of years, they couldn't have been more stable at QB. This is the first time where quarterback is a huge question mark for this team, not just in terms of who's going to play the position. How long will the leash be? How good will they be? How will the offense fit their talents? Who's going to be the backup after the portal window opens up again in May? Um, I'm curious as to how we get answers to those questions over the next uh, whatever it is, six, seven months. Definitely interesting to be covering the team with question mark at quarterback after all those years where you knew Desmond Ritter was here and Ben Bryant, but now you don't know, even though Ben Bryant is still here. We'll get to more on the quarterback battle after uh, I tell you how this episode of Lockdown Bearcats is brought to you by, oh, I'm sorry, that is the wrong, that is the wrong live read. I am sorry for that. That is not until the Second segment break. Today's episode of Lockdown Bearcats is brought to you by Bill Farr. See, I'm, I'm in such a betting mood today. Um, here we go. So are you looking for a delicious treat but don't want all of the fat and calories? Then you got to try a Bill Farr. We just got through the holidays, and I know my goal is to eat a little healthier this year. If you're like me where you want to eat healthier but don't want to compromise taste, then, man, I've got just the thing for you. you got to try Bill because with Bill, healthy is actually tasty. Seriously, they're so delicious, you – won't think they're good for you, perfect for your New Year's resolution. What makes Bilt Bar so good? Well, for starters, they're all covered in 100% real chocolate. That's right, real chocolate. And they come in unbelievably good flavors like churro, peanut butter brownie, and coconut almond. I'm not sure how Bilt does, but these bars taste like a candy bar while maintaining amazing macros. And what's even better is that they are healthy. That's right, 
only 130 calories and 4 grams of sugar with a whopping 17 grams of protein. And now you don't need to wait around to get a box for years. We've been talking about ordering your Built Bars at Built.com. Now you can get them at your local Walmart or Sam's Club. That's right. Head to your nearest Walmart today, walk to the pharmacy section, and grab yourself a box of Built Bars. You can pick up a four-bar box of cookies and cream, double chocolate or coconut puffs. And if you're close to Sam's Club, run in and grab a 13-bar box with our hit flavors, brownie batter and churro. You can thank me later. Built Bars is revolutionizing deliciousness while maintaining healthiness. Hey, thanks again for making Lockdown Bearcats your first listen every day. Now make sure you check out our brand new podcast, Lockdown College Basketball, everything you need to know about college basketball in one place. Plus, hear from big name experts, insiders, coaches, and players. Locked on College Basketball is available on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. Mo Egger from ESPN 1530 and 700 WLW joining me today right here on Locked on Bearcats. Big game tonight in the Big Easy. Mo, you will be there mm-hmm. um, for this big tilt with Dan Horde and Terry Nelson. I hear that um, the struggle for the stake is going to be awarded to Mr. Terry Nelson. Is that true? He's uh, two years overdue, but yes, as uh, as folks listen to this, we will have uh, we will we will have treated Terry to his steak. The rule is it cannot be well done. He gets his steaks well done. That is a crime against uh, anybody yes. who's a carnivore. But uh, yes, the uh, struggle for the steak wager will be paid off. As a medium, as someone who loves their steaks medium rare, I concur with that mm. belief. Um, We'll get to Bearcats in Tulane in just a minute. I want to ask you this because, like, I, I, I said this last year, and I felt this last year, and I feel it this way right now, Mo. I feel like the quarterback battle not only is going to affect this year, but it could affect next year as well. And I say that because you mentioned Evan Prater still here. I think that's significant. And, yes, he struggled in his first two starts. Were the circumstances ideal for him to start? I don't necessarily think so. But he's got a ways to go, I feel like. And how he – do you think, Mo, how he develops in the spring, the uh, fall camp, and whether or not that leads to playing time, like that could have a huge impact not only in the quarterback room, but this Bearcats program both this year and next year. Do you agree with that? Well, sure. I mean, he's he's sort of sandwiched in the middle be, be behind two guys who have now extensive playing experience, one guy at the Power 5 level, the other guy who was the starter last year and behind him is the quote unquote quarterback of the future. So Evan Prater is sort of in a, in a weird spot. And when we've had a chance to see him play, let's be honest, he left a lot to be desired. Now is, is part of that to be expected just because of, of his lack of experience? Um, sure. Is part of that to be expected because of the, the quality of the team they went up against when they played Tulane. And just the weirdness of the whole bowl game, sure. I, I I don't know that Evan was really set up for for success, but he 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 is positioned behind a couple of guys who have had more college football success. There are legitimate questions about Evan's abilities as a thrower, and there's a guy behind him that people made a big deal about Scott Satterfield being able to uh, maintain his commitment to UC with with uh, with uh, Brady Drogish. So I think Evan's in kind of a weird spot. I would have guessed I would have guessed that Evan was going to hit the portal. So the fact that he's here at least tells you he's open to coming back, but in what capacity? Is he going to be the third string quarterback? Is he going to be content to be the backup quarterback? Does he have any chance to start? Does he get a chance to start if whoever is in front of him stumbles? Will they leapfrog him with the younger guy? Like Lot there's a lot that's going to go into it. Um, I don't know, but what doesn't work in Evans Prater is a body of work that wows you. And so, unfortunately, he has to overcome players in front of him, players behind him, and what the tape shows. Now, again, players do improve, and there's no reason to just take two starts and go. Evan can't play starting quarterback in in the Big Twelve. That's not fair. But he is positioned in a weird place and. I'm fascinated how things are going to play out once some degree of pecking order has been established. Again, I think Emory Jones was brought here to be the starting quarterback, and so I'm going to be surprised if week one against EKU, he's not the guy. But how much of a fair shake does Evan really get? How much of a fair shake does Ben Bryant get? And are both of those guys going to be content with coming back and serving in a backup role? And if the answer is yes, Evan Prater's really going to come back and be the third string quarterback? I I think that would surprise a lot of people if that was the case. 
It really is fascinating to think about. And there are a lot of great points you bring up there, Mo. It's interesting to me how Evan Prater comes in as this highly touted recruit, and he's barely played. And now the situation for him, it's going to be awfully difficult for him to uh, get playing time, it sounds like, and ultimately be the starter. Let's switch gears here to the hardwood. We got a big game tonight in the Big Easy, the Bearcats and Tulane. Mo, what's the biggest factor going into this game? Because I watched Tulane beat a very good Memphis team on the road on Saturday. The Bearcats are coming in with a two-game winning streak. There are massive implications as far as conference tournament seeding in this game. Bearcats can go for the season sweep over Tulane. What's the biggest factor going into tonight's game for you? Well, for me, you're you're looking at a team that's averaging 81 points per game. The Bearcats uh, over the last few weeks have been really good defensively. If that continues, then I think this team is going to be okay. I you see basketball it's kind of in a weird spot, right? We're we're not really talking about their NCAA tournament bona fides. They don't have the resume, they don't have the wins, but we have seen I think a pretty dramatic uptick in how watchable they are and how good they are, right? This is this is a this team is playing pretty well. Now, Unfortunately, they couldn't close the uh, the Houston game, and unfortunately, they just dug themselves too much of a hole against Memphis. But I think for the most part, really since the the first of the year, this team has played pretty well. You got to figure out a way to slow down Jalen Cook. I, I think this team is at its best when it defends and when it rebounds, and they've defended much much better. This team has improved by leaps and bounds defensively from where they were back in November to to what they've become here as. Uh, as we get as we head into the second week of, of February, and I think if that continues, this team is is going to have a chance. Obviously, it's a better team when they shoot the ball well from outside. That could sort of be hit or mix, hit or miss. I think the key to this team, you know, I, I watch Landers Nolly sometimes, and I, I I wish he were more assertive when the games got really really hard. And when he is, boy, this team can really take off because Victor Locken, I think, is going to be an all-league guy. We we all know the the offensive performer that uh, David Julius can be. I think they've done a really good job of transitioning from Jeremiah Davenport as a starter to what they've become now. But the guy to me who still can just make everything go for that team is Landers Nolly. And if he was, if he's aggressive when the game gets hard. This is a different looking basketball team. The Houston game was hard and he was aggressive and I loved it. And so this two lane game is going to get hard. This is a pretty good basketball team. You're obviously playing on the road. If the game tonight gets hard, does Landers Nolly step up? I think that is a, that is a big, big part of, of tonight. It's a big part of what this team has in front of it moving forward. I know you got to run. You're traveling to new Orleans for tonight's game. Uh, let me ask you this real quick. Um, it looks like this Bearcats team, if they are going to reach the NCAA tournament, they're probably going to have to win the conference tournament. So what chance uh -huh. do you give them to do that? And if they were to play Houston for a third time, given what we saw just over a week ago, could they beat them if they get to play them again? You know, sure. I, I think sometimes what you have to have happen is a team like Houston is largely unmotivated, right? Uh, they don't need to win the conference tournament. They have larger aspirations than winning the AAC tournament. And, you know, we've, we've seen plenty of teams like that not be at their best in the conference tournament. The reality is Houston is better. Houston's one of the, I think the best five or six teams in the country. I think most would agree. Can the Bearcats win the American athletic conference tournament? Sure. Um, I, I, I don't think that that's too far fetched, but you know, the reality is in games that they are quote, not supposed to win. They haven't won this year. Um, and so you're probably going to have to do that at least twice. That might be a bit much to ask, but this is a better team than we were watching a month ago. If that improvement continues, I think we'll feel good about their chances of making noise once, uh, once they get to Dallas. All right. Uh, good stuff. Mo as always. Now you got to run safe travels to new Orleans. Enjoy the game tonight and uh, we'll talk here soon. Okay. Okay, man. Thank you. Mo Egger from ESPN 1530 and 700 WLW, kind enough to join me today right here on Lockdown Bearcats. We will talk more about this game and the Bearcats NCAA tournament chances after I tell you how this episode of Lockdown Bearcats is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook this year. The only app you need at your Super Bowl party 
is FanDuel, America's number one sports book. We're really excited about our new sports betting partner for Locked On because they're the number one sports book in America, FanDuel. And if you're new to FanDuel, that's even better. They have so many great features that make betting on sports fun and easy. Download FanDuel now so you can bet Super Bowl 57 with a no-sweat first bet. You'll get up to $3,000 back in bonus bets if your first bet does not win. FanDuel lets you bet on everything from the money line to point spreads to who will score a touchdown Super Bowl 57 between the Kansas City Chiefs and the Philadelphia Eagles right now on FanDuel. The line, the spread is still at one minus one and a half. Philadelphia minus one and a half. I will take that in the Eagles to cover, and I'll take a slight over on the over under at 50 and a half. The FanDuel Sportsbook app is safe, secure, and super easy to use. Best of all, you can get you can get paid your winnings instantly. Um, I like the FanDuel app. It's super easy to use. So join FanDuel today at FanDuel.com slash locked on to claim your no sweat first bet on Super Bowl 57. That's FanDuel.com slash Lockdown. Make every moment more with FanDuel, official sportsbook partner of the NFL. Bearcats Tulane tonight. That is a 7 o'clock tip on ESPN+. Plus. Dan Horde, Terry Nelson, Mo Egger with the call on 700 WLW from Devlin Fieldhouse in New Orleans. Um, I think this is going to be a really interesting game. And I think one of two things is going to happen. I think one... This game is going to be a lot like the first game between these two teams when the Bearcats won 78 to fit, I'm sorry, 88 to 78. And that was a terrific offensive performance by Cincinnati. Both teams were strong offensively, but the Bearcats came out and built a big lead in the first half and ultimately held off a very, very, very good two lane team. Um, I think it also could be a case for the Bearcats defense, which has been playing much better of late. You saw them against, um, uh, Tulsa on Wednesday night last week and UCF on Saturday. They are really starting to get things going defensively. And if this team can do that, much like a lot of the McCronin teams and Bob Huggins teams, they're going to be in every single game. So this game tonight, you're going on the road. It's not the best, it's not the best environment um, historically for a road basketball game, but you're still going on the road. Um, it's the first time the Bearcats are going on the road there since I believe 2021. They won that game at Tulane. It was a close game. It was on Super Bowl Sunday. So I'm looking at this and I'm saying to myself, if the Bearcats can win this game, they can steal a win at Tulane. And this has been a team the last two years that has really not been able to, as Roy Williams, who West Miller played under, Roy Williams has a, 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 a line stealing brownies. You can steal some brownies at Tulane tonight. That's going to put you in a really good position. You're going to be 17 and 8, 8 and 4 in American Athletic Conference play. You've got three very winnable games coming up after this one USF, which I'll be there on Saturday. That's a very winnable game. ECU on the road. That should be a win. That's next Wednesday. And then UCF next Sunday. On the road. Now, that's the end that. Now, playing UCF on the road is not an easy task. We've seen the Bearcats struggle there. In fact, they've lost their three of the last four times. But you have to think if you can win tonight, the Bearcats can win tonight. The road for them to maintain a an aggressive pursuit at the number two seat is going to be really, really good. Um, that is what a win will do tonight. We look at the standings right now in the American Athletic Conference. Um, Houston is 10 and one, only lost to Temple at home. Uh, Tulane is eight and three, Temple's eight and three, Memphis is seven and three, Bearcats are seven and four. There's that log jam between two through five. And the Bearcats right now are one and two against those three teams. So a win tonight would make you two and two against the teams just ahead of you in the conference. You've got Temple and Memphis in two weeks, back to back, Temple at home, Memphis on the road. If you can take care of if you can beat Tulane tonight and steal some brownies, then take care of UCF. I'm sorry, USF, ECU, and UCF who are below you. You're going to be set up. You're going to be set up in great position to uh, make that run at the two seed or at the very least a three seed. Because again, you don't want to face Houston until the conference championship game. Now, one question I was going to ask Mo um, 
and I'll try and, and I'll offer my opinion here. Who's the more valuable player between Landers Nolly and David DeJulius? I think right now Landers Nolly is the best player. As Mo just said, in a game the Bearcats should win, he is very, very good. Now we have seen him be assertive in games that are hard. I saw him score 30, we saw him score 33 points against Arizona. And then against Houston last week, he was tremendous battling two knee, knee injuries in both knees. I mean, that is, that's tough stuff. David DeJulius right now is probably your most valuable player. And it's much more so than what he can do on the offensive end. He's a lead, He's the leader of this team, and he's been the voice of this team really since the second game of the 2020-21 season. And that was obviously not a memorable season by any means for the Cincinnati Bearcats. But we saw against, after the Xavier game, and DeJulius is crying in the locker room. And he understands how much the game, that game meant to him and the Bearcats. And that was only his second game as a Bearcat. We knew he was going to be a very good player. He was a very good acquisition in the transfer portal. But what we didn't know was just how much of a leader he was going to be. And he is that. You can't replace that. And I think you saw to a degree. Remember at the end of that season, the Julius um, stepped away for mental health reasons? Um, I think when he came back for the conference tournament, you saw the jolt that that gave this team. You saw um, the Bearcats take it to SMU. Now, SMU mounted a furious comeback in the second half, but still. Um, you saw them against Wichita State hold off a very good Shockers team. And then, in that offseason, he was the one who said, when all the, when the mass exodus of players happened, he said that all of it was going to come to a head eventually. And he didn't really say what was going to happen. He just said, very matter-of-factly, it's all going to come to a head at some point. Whether that meant John Brandon was fired, whether it meant that, you know, um, differences could be reconciled. Ultimately, we know what happened. And Julius is still here. And in the previous two years that have been about rebuilding the program, he's been the leader of it. There's no question about it. Nolly is probably your best player. Is probably the best player on this team. The Julius is the leader. And what he can do on the offensive end, and what he did on Saturday in particular, closing the deal, playing a huge role in that, that's why he is the most valuable player. And there's a difference. But imagine if Landers Nolly, in a big game like tonight, if he's assertive late, if he's assertive when the Bearcats take on Temple at home, which I think is going to be a pretty good crowd, and then you go on the road to Memphis, and you know what I want to see from that game? And I, I don't know if Landers Nolly still has any, um, um, what do you say, um, any resentment towards the Memphis program. But I want to see him go into his old stopping grounds and just take it to them and make Memphis realize who they lost last offseason. That's the second to last game of the season. It could have major implications both for the conference tournament and maybe the NCAA tournament. I'm not ready to say this team is going to the NCAA tournament. I'm still hopeful that they can. I think that I think this team, if they get hot at the right time, is going to be a team to watch in the conference tournament and a bid stealer. And yeah, it's fun right now because the Bearcats, I feel like, are ascending. And that's why tonight's so important. Don't take a step back. Keep you know, keep building. You know, this is another building block. Win this game on the road Tuesday night in New Orleans against a good two-lane team who just beat Memphis. They're probably going to come in happy. Stop, step on the gas pedal early and see what happens. Very excited for tonight's game. Very excited today to wish a happy birthday to my dad, Larry Frank, one of the very loyal listener of Locked On Bearcats. Love you and hope you are having a fantastic birthday. Um, He's the one who got me in sports way back in uh, 2005 with the 05 Cincinnati Bengals. Um, Chad Johnson, TJ Cushman's out of Carson Palmer, um, Rudy Johnson, all those guys. 
So happy birthday to him. And um, maybe he's going to have a steak tonight. I don't know. That is going to do it for me today right here on Lockdown Bearcats tomorrow. Big day tomorrow. Um, first off, uh, uh, um, Lockdown Bearcats, your first listen every day. We are going to talk about how much of a factor the offensive line and wide receiver rooms are going to be this season for the Cincinnati Bearcats and how that will contribute to the offense's potential this season. And we will recap the Bearcats and Tulane game tonight. Thanks for making us your first listen of every day. For your second listen, check out our brand new podcast, Locked On College Basketball Experts, experts Isaac Shade and Andy Patton bring you everything you need to know on and off the court. Plus, here for big name experts, coaches, and players throughout the basketball landscape, Locked On College Basketball is available on YouTube and wherever you get your podcast. Thanks for making us your first listen every day. I'm Alex Frank for Locked On Bearcats. Um, I'm on Twitter at Frankie underscore Natty with two N's and N-A-T-I. Instagram, Alex Frank and underscore an email at Alex Frank at gmail.com. Back tomorrow with another episode of Locked On Bearcats. Until then, have a great rest of your day. And by the way, also uh, um, happy birthday to my cousin Naomi in, where is she nowadays? Cornell, New York, Ithaca, New York. Uh, she's a Chicagoan. So happy birthday to her. Everybody's got a birthday today. And today is also, for historic references, the 59th anniversary of the British invasion of the Beatles, the Rolling Stones. I'm sorry, not the British invasion. I got that wrong. The 59th anniversary of the Beatles landing in America. How about that? Um, so if you've got a birthday on February 7th, like my dad and my cousin Naomi, whew, you're in good company. Have a great rest of your day. I'll be back tomorrow right here on Lockdown Bearcats, part of the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day.